Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Wednesday, February 10th, 2021, and today we're going to be talking about the Republican Party releasing their list of 47 House Democrats that are on the target list, on the target for the 2020 presidential, not presidential, wow, that'd be very strange, midterm election year where the Democratic Party is looking to defend and maintain their trifecta, winning the House and Senate in 2020, and of course the presidency, handing the Democrats a trifecta and democratic uh, in, in government control for the first time since 2008, uh, that 2008 election. They left it in 2011 when Republicans picked up 63 seats in the House in 2010. And that's exactly what the Republican Party is trying to do now. These 47 House Democrats seem to be priority number one for the GOP moving forward. Uh, they likely will have a good shot at the Senate, but the House seems to be a little bit better considering that redistricting is officially underway and that Republicans control the majority of the states in terms of the redistricting process, even in states that voted for Joe Biden on the presidential level. Now, before we take a look at these 47 House Democrats, we're going to be talking about the House results in 2020. Now, just to uh, tell you now, I'm not going to go to each individual district just because that would take up way too much time. And that's reserved for the next two years when we're talking about where the Republican Party can gain seats. But overall, we're going to take a few examples and talk about why the Republican Party might try to target some of these seats, especially in a year where we're not going to see the exact same House map as 2020. So let's take a look uh, at the results so far. You know, looking at the 2020 election results, I would say many of us were surprised. I was very surprised, to say the least, considering Democrats were set to gain seats in the United States House of Representatives. Historically, it made sense. In 2016, the Democrats gained seats in the House of Representatives. In 2012, the same exact thing. In 2008, you know, the same thing. I'm not going to show you. You can find it on uh, really any website, but uh, we're going to go ahead and just talk about the results and why they were shocking because the Democratic Party was expected by 538 and counts, uh, you know, other media sources that expected Democrats to, in the worst case, be in the low 230s. In some estimates, they were above 250 seats. It was equally as likely for the Democrats to have 252 seats in the House as it was of the exact outcome that we have right now, at least according to statistical models. But because Republicans outperformed Donald Trump on the down ballot level and there was record breaking turnout on both sides, not just the Democrats, the Republicans ultimately benefited from it. And this is their first presidential election year gaining seats in the House since 2004. So it's certainly been a long time coming for the GOP to actually do this. And overall, the map here shows a closer popular vote margin than the presidential level. If you look at the presidential numbers, 51.3 minus 46.8 gives us 4.5%. But in the House of Representatives, that margin for the Democrats is simply 3.1%. Nowhere near that five-point margin of victory on the popular vote in the presidential level. So like I had said, Republicans outperformed Trump down ballot. There are a number of Biden district Republicans up in 2022. That seems to be the prime target for Democrats. They haven't released an entire comprehensive list the same way the Republican Party has. Uh, but this 47 uh, Democrat list definitely gives the uh, Democratic uh, Party a very good idea of which races could potentially flip. On top of that, which freshmen or also long lasting incumbents could potentially lose the uh, 2022 midterm elections in their districts. Because when we go underway, with our new uh, redistricting process, what we are going to see is that overall, you know, many states are going to be the same. Many states are going to be the same with their congressional districts. There will be slight altercations, and some states only have one congressional district. But with some of these other Republicans, if the Republican part, some of these other Democrats, if Republicans have the ability to redistrict, and in many states they do, even Democratic states, they will redistrict the uh, congressional districts to favor. The Republican Party, if there are incumbents that the Democrats are, are, you know, solid on that they know would be hard to defeat from the right, they will put them in districts that are not favorable or they will redraw their congressional district. Now, the thing about the House rules is that uh, representatives can run wherever they want. You know, if they're in the state, they can run in any congressional district. But it makes it difficult to, you know, that argument that you're not carpetbagging if you're going to a completely different part of the state, if your name recognition is strong in one sub subsection, but it's completely drawn into a conservative district. So either you run with no name recognition against another incumbent or uh, you're just going to give up this House race, whatever it might be. Redistricting ultimately will put the Republican Party in the favorite to win the House of Representatives in 2022. And these 47 targets makes it even easier for the GOP. 
Now, after we go through this list, let's look at a few examples and talk about what the Republican Party is trying to replicate when it comes to the 2022 midterm elections, because these 47 Democratic incumbents are being targeted for a reason. Democrats only have 222 House seats. You take away 47 and they're back to where they were back in 2014, even worse than that. But looking at these 47 uh, Democrats, you know, they come from districts that could have been easily seen immediately after the either uh, the 2018 or 2020 uh, House election results. Let's take the first one on this list alphabetically, Arizona's first congressional district. Well, if we take a look, Tom O'Halloran has actually faced a pretty strong opposition in this race. But to be fair, I don't think his Republican was as strong as they could have been. His district had always been competitive. Even in 2018, it wasn't as solid. Uh, as I mean, it was better than it was in 2020, but it wasn't as solid as Democrats would have liked. This is easily uh, an opportunity for the GOP to pick up. And I don't know why they don't have... Um, <clears throat> A county map here but uh main thing to take away here is that these districts are being targeted for a reason because of the closeness the close nature of these races um let's go over to california you know we have the third congressional district it should be right around here the 10th is also on that list right here you know the third congressional district it's being targeted currently uh you know it was a 10 point margin of victory for the democrats in uh 2020 or nine point margin of victory uh, but it's certainly on the uh list because of the incumbents here you know looking at then they are likely to be slightly adjusted into districts that are a little bit more competitive. When you see the uh, incumbents winning by large margins, you can sort of realize, you know, maybe you can draw out one or two, either Democrat or Republican counties to make the surrounding district a little bit more Democrat or a little bit more Republican. Ultimately, this is just a game of gerrymandering. And what these incumbents are going to be facing is either uh, a worse uh, field to run in or possibly being drawn in with another representative intentionally so that we have to, uh, you know, face off against each other in a primary and, just make it very difficult for a lot of these incumbents to win their elections. But the main takeaway is that these districts districts are being targeted for a reason. Uh, you know, they would not be doing this. They are not targeting congressional districts that are very safe. When you take a look at places in the Northeast, they're not targeting Vermont at large. It just wouldn't make sense. Democrats win there by very large amounts. They're not targeting Maine's first district, but they are targeting Maine's second district. The reason it's a much closer race, and they know that it makes sense to target closer races, especially if Donald Trump was able to carry these Republicans either to a very close point or drastically narrow up the margin than what it's traditionally used to. Arizona's first district was actually uh, in one of its closest election years, despite the entire state shifting to the left. The district shifted to the right. Uh, looking at these 47 lists, uh, we can keep going. I mean, some of these names are very recognizable. Katie Porter, very recognizable. Charlie Crist, very recognizable. Lucy McBath, uh, Caroline, uh, Carolyn uh, Bordeaux. We can actually take a look at those congressional districts. I'm going to zoom in because they're right next to each other. I could just click it right here. But the 7th district was a flip. It was won because the Republican incumbent retired. The Democrats picked it up. Georgia's 6th district, which is uh, where John Ossoff actually ran back in 2017 and lost. Lucy McBath won by 10 points. Karen Handel handed it yet again another election defeat in Georgia. First it was statewide, then she narrowly won a Senate spe uh, a special election in the House race, then lost in 2018, and then lost in 2020. But the districts themselves, we could see the Republican Party try to combine the districts, make it safe blue. Lucy McBath or Carolyn Bordeaux would end up being you know, forced out of the district and forced to run in a new conservative district. So it looks like these two are on the list, not because possibly they could be defeated in 2020, 2022, given the same type of district, possibly due to redistricting. And, you know, these Republicans are targeting these uh, House seats because they know either they need to be redistricted out, they need to be put in a more conservative district, or, you know, they are prime targets. And like I had mentioned, you know, recognizable name. Let's take Iowa's third district, for example. This one was very surprising that it had gone to the Democrats. At least one had gone to the Democrats in years past, but Iowa's second district certainly was a shock. This was solid for the Democratic Party before there is no incumbent, I'll give you that, uh, but it was won by only six votes as well. So, you know, out of 400,000 votes, it was won by six votes. Uh, honestly, it's definitely winnable for Democrats in 2022, but the neighboring district, not so much. And I know that seems weird because even in 2020, Iowa's second went red and Iowa's third went blue, but the exact opposite could happen in 2022 once we revert back to our traditional type of expectation in a uh, midterm election year, given that Joe Biden is definitely going to try to, and partially has succeeded so far, in returning American politics to the normal sense, the Obama sense, the Bush sense, the Clinton sense, uh, the sense of normalcy that uh, we had before President Trump. He completely rewrote the entire political game 
made it so a number of people were able to be as outspoken as him and elected to Congress, uh, you know, endorse him and be elected in swing districts, whatever it might be. Overall, you know, Donald Trump completely rewrote the political atmosphere. But I think once we start returning to a normal sense, we are going to see those uh, normal Democratic districts that may have swung because of Trump revert back to being Democratic districts. And then those traditional GOP districts with suburban voters possibly swing back to Republicans, uh, but, you know, voted for Joe Biden because they simply did not like Donald Trump. And I think that could largely carry a number of these Democrats uh, to defeat. And I know that sounds weird to say, but overall, you know, this message of Donald Trump certainly helped them on the presidential level. Um, but the the drastic turnout amongst rural areas and just voters that had typically not voted for before, but voted for Donald Trump in this election, you know, he was able to completely shift a number of these states. While they may, not, they may have shifted to the left, they only shifted by half a percentage point or one percentage point. And that was because despite Donald Trump losing the popular vote by five percentage points, you know, he was still able to keep a number of these states very solid in his comment column. He still won Texas by 5.5%. He won Iowa by eight points, Ohio by eight points. The margins were too large. You know, the Democratic Party simply couldn't overcome Donald Trump's support and he carried Republicans to victory. Uh, and, you know, what we are going to see is that a number of these Democrats who were able to win because of Joe Biden and were able to absorb Joe Biden's down ballot effect. I mean, it works both ways. There were times where Joe Biden carried Democrats to victory down ballot. Uh, you know, Georgia is actually a perfect example. And then there were other where areas where Donald Trump was able to carry Republicans to victory. And with these Democrats that were elected out of spite for Donald Trump from these suburban voters, traditionally, uh, you know, white voters that are almost always solid for the GOP, except for 2016 and 2020. Well, what, what could happen is that these Republicans, traditional Republicans, uh, white voters end up switching back to the Republican Party because uh, it's no longer, you know, Donald Trump at the top of the ticket. And there is no longer a Donald Trump in office to show your uh, complete, uh, I guess, anger at his presidency. And looking at this House map, I honestly think that could be something that's very possible. You know, Georgia's sixth congressional district. I want to show you exactly what happened there back in 2016. This was just four years ago, five years ago, if you want to be fancy about it, but it's really four years ago. And we can take a look at Georgia. I mean, this was won by Tom Price by a very, very solid amount. And I know, you know, we just saw a Democrat win there by 10 percentage points, but just four years earlier, I want you to take a look at the results in uh, the House of Representatives. Let's see if we can find it. 2016, he carried 61% of the vote, 61% of the vote. That is very large. Uh, you know, that is very large, uh, you know, considering that the entire district itself is now very democratic he won 61 percent of the vote in 2016 when donald trump underperformed in that state and in 2014 he won 66 percent of the vote so looking at the uh, results in georgia in 2016 i mean those numbers were very interesting and we actually had some interesting uh ratings i don't even think they considered georgia's sixth district to be competitive because it wasn't even on here uh, but looking at that vacancy you know it opened up got very very narrow and then it ended up flipping to the Democrats. I mean, the swing from 2016 to 2020 must be over 20 points by now. And that is just a very fascinating detail. You know, looking at these House districts that are now being targeted by the GOP, well, they previously were GOP strongholds. But that's exactly why we could see the previous GOP strongholds that flipped because of Trump possibly revert back to being in the Republican column. And I had mentioned that we would talk about what the Republican Party is going to try to do. You can find this list of 47 on rollcall.com, but we're not going to focus too much on the remaining representatives. What we are going to be talking about is what the Republican Party envisions for their House performance in 2022 and why they're targeting specifically 47 or 40 plus House Democrats, because this is a very bold list. They know they are not going to carry all 47, at least for the sake of the Democratic Party. They are not going to carry all 47 of these districts but their targets for a reason they want to carry 20 30 possibly 40 out of the 47 because if they can do that they can replicate their victories in years past now let's take a look at 2010 this was the largest house pickup since 1948 for either political party and largest for the republicans since 1938 uh you know looking at these numbers uh john boehner you know previously the minority leader under uh you know before when pelosi was speaker of the house but uh, you know john boehner his party picked up 63 seats in the House of Representatives in 2010. Take a look at all of that red. All of those, uh, you know, darker red colors means that this was a pickup. Both seats in New Hampshire, a lot of New York, a lot of upstate New York, all across the United States, across Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico. Is that a fidget spinner? What type of district is that? Uh, you know, Colorado, 
the South, where the Democrats got really hit very hard. Uh, North and South Dakota previously had Democratic representatives. I want to show you the Democratic Party's peak in the 21st century because it is very fascinating that Democrats were able to win some of these areas. Take a look at that. Won a district in Idaho. Fascinating. Won both North and South Dakota. Completely dominated the South. Look at that. So much blue. Carried the majority of congressional districts in Arkansas. 2010 rolled around and it said absolutely not. This is not going to happen again and it hasn't happened since. Taking a look at this map, this is exactly what the Republican Party wants to see on Wikipedia when they wake up uh, in November, you know, 2022, immediately after election night. Looking at the 2010 results, the Republicans picked up 63 seats. They went from 178 to 242. What a very, very, very large pickup. Democrats went from 256 to 193. You know, those 63 Democrats that lost, it was honestly, you know, a very critical blow to the Obama administration for the next six years. And the Democrats didn't win back control. The only district where Democrats were able to pick up actually two. They had one, uh, sorry, three. They had one in Hawaii. They had one in Louisiana. And then they had, surprisingly, uh, you know, Joe Biden's home state of Delaware. That one actually was very solid in 2008 for the GOP. I guess the fact of the incumbency works very well. Um, but that's just, you know, pointing that out. But then, you know, what also they could be trying to replicate is 2014, an arguably worse year for Democrats because they lost control of the Senate and lost more seats in the House than they did in 2010. They didn't lose 60 plus seats, but they only carried 188. They had around 100 and what, uh, 192 in 2010. They had 193 seats in 2010. Now, you know, in 2014, they only had 188. There were a number of Republican pickups, while Democrats were able to carry Nebraska's second district, which baffles me to this day. Um, you know, the Republicans overall came with a net gain of 13 in 2014. So it put the Democrats at their lowest point in the entire 21st century at 188 seats. 2016 rolls around, the Democrats are able to pick it up. And then 2018, the Democrats win back control of the House of Representatives. But then 2020, the Republicans make a net gain of 14. It makes the House the closest it's been since 2000. Uh, 2000. Uh, you know, looking at these 47 House Democrats, if the Democrats lose five out of the 47, they will lose control of the House of Representatives, but this is largely banking on President Biden being unpopular, and so far, that just simply isn't happening. Now, I know we're nearly one month into his presidency. We shouldn't be looking too uh, deep into the popularity rating, but it is a telling sign that Joe Biden is much more approved of than Donald Trump was at the beginning of his presidency, and while I don't think Joe Biden's approval rating will always be high, I do think that it is important just to point that small bit out, but what happens in midterm election years is not that uh, it's just the midterm. You know, these happen because the, the incumbents are unpopular by the time you reach the midterm election. Let's take the two most recent presidents, for example, Donald Trump and Barack Obama. Around, you know, two years into their presidency, right around the midterm time, you know, they had very low approval ratings. Obama had a 44.6% approval rating. Donald Trump had a 41.8% approval rating, both of which lost their House seats, uh, lost seats in the House for their incumbent parties and very dramatic amounts. Donald Trump lost 40 Barack Obama lost 63. Overall, just wasn't a good look for the parties, uh, you know, themselves because of the unpopularity rating of these uh, incumbents. You know, look at the disapproval rating. It was higher. You know, around that point, Obama had a 49% disapproval rating, a net negative 5. Donald Trump had a 52.8% disapproval rating, a net negative 11. What we saw was that when presidents are unpopular, the midterms don't exactly work in their favor. In the 21st century, we've only had one time where the midterm election actually was beneficial for the incumbent party, and that was George W. Bush. And his disapproval rating around that time was in the low 30s, and his approval rating around that time was in the low 60s. So it really didn't matter. He was popular, but for the rest of the presidents, not so much. Uh, when Clinton lost control of the uh, House, Democrats did it for the first time in 40 years, four decades. You know, Democrats controlled the House even under Reagan when he sweeped 49 states. But looking at, you know, Bill Clinton's approval rating, it was low. And this started the trend that had always been established in American politics, but it was still very difficult for Democrats to lose the House because they had held it for so long. But overall, you know, Bill Clinton ultimately was the first Democrat in a very long time to lose the House, especially as an incumbent. Um, and looking at the uh, approval rating numbers, it's directly correlated. You know, when the approval rating is low, you lose control. That's simply how it is. So that's what the Republican Party is trying to bank on. They want to uh, ensure that Joe Biden is an unpopular president. And whether they do that through blocking everything that he wants to do or, you know, working with uh, Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, whoever it might be, trying to just, you know, overall just block everything Joe Biden wants to do, that could make him unpopular. And they could easily try to replicate 
what they're doing in 2014, what they did in 2010, because it it worked. You know, it worked. Attacking the president, pinning everything on him was a, sta a tactic that's been used for centuries. It was working for the Democrats in 2018. It worked for the Republicans in 2010, 2014. No reason why it wouldn't work in 2022. So these 47 Democrats, you have been warned. That's essentially what the GOP is telling them. You know, the Democrats need to ramp up their efforts to maintain the Democratic trifecta, because if they don't do it, if they lose just five, just five out of these 47 seats, Republicans will take control. Five out of 47. It can be done. It can be defended with the Democratic Party. But it also is very likely the GOP draws districts to make themselves back in the majority. On top of that, they target these 47 Democratic incumbents. And we've seen larger gains in midterm election years uh, for the Republican Party. So it's not out of the question that they pick up 47. Uh, but Democrats can't even afford to lose five. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 election videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.